Coming this month to the USA Network, a Camp Midnight early evening showcase theater movie presentation of a cult comedy classic about a troubled youth searching for the meaning of life and a feisty old wench who shows him the way. Dancing on the moon, I'm dancing on the moon. Dick Wilson is Harold. Dancing on the moon. No, this is Mrs. Finley. Mr. Finley has a much higher voice. God will get you for that, Harold. B. Arthur is Maud. Harold and Maud. imperialist infidel peace. Original music by the incomparable Cat Stevens. Dancing on the moon, I'm dancing on the moon. Harold and Maud, Thursday at 5, directly following the Cartoon Express. Dancing on the moon. It's USA's Camp Midnight, starring Dick Wilson. Join Dick and his guests, Keith Gordon, Bud Court, comedian John Campanera, from the L.A. Zoo, Susan Normandia, musical guests Bardo, Jackie Stallone, and Scooter Peach and the band. And here's your host, Dick Wilson! <laughs> Welcome, folks, to USA Network's Camp Midnight. That's still the name of the show, isn't it, Scooter? We haven't changed. Camp Midnight's still the name? Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, that's the name. name. That's the hey, name. Hey, uh, we're glad you're with us tonight, and we've got a good show lined up for you. A lot of great people going to be on. And I want you to say hello to Scooter Peach and the band right here. Here they are. Yeah, Scooter was a little late getting to the show tonight. It was Nude Teller Day down at the drive-in bank. He was down there trying to get a deposit. Wouldn't that yeah. be great? Yeah, Nude I made day? a few deposits there and a couple yeah. withdrawals. I went, I, this, this Los Angeles is a real, ooh, that was the old, okay. This, I did a, had a strange experience. See, I come from Kansas City where I live during the week, and I come out here on the weekends. And I went to a hairstyling salon today that was so, it was so chic, Scooter, that, you know, mm. normally they play the speakers, the music to the speakers in the ceiling. Mm. This place had a DJ laying up on the ceiling that took requests. Have you ever, have you, any of you been there? It's an incredible place. You'll have to try it out. But I'll take you over there and you can play on the ceiling with him sometime, would you? Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of things. A couple of things. scary there. A couple of things I want to show you around here because, uh, you know, we're a couple of shows into the place. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we have... What looks like a stained glass window back behind my chair here. I don't want you to think we've come into some money and that you should quit feeling sorry for us. See, this is just paper, and it's all done by lights there, all right? Now, if you have just joined us for tonight, come on over here. It's a little, little, little dark over here. Up here on the wall, we have, of course, our collection of styrofoam cups. These are the ones that we can afford for our celebrities who have been on the show. And as you notice, we've got uh, Who's oh, up Ad there? Adrian Barbeau, we've got uh, a lot of people, Dick Clark, we've got, uh, uh, who else is up? Jackie Diamond, incredible comic, and they all also take a bite out of it so that we can get their denture plates in case there's some kind of identifying of them to do in the future, so, so we'll know that, so that's good. Well, it's been one heck of a week, you know, Scooter? We've got a new president in the White House, mm -hmm. and... Uh, you know, uh, Looking forward to four years of that. Well, President Bush is in there now. Uh, Ronald Reagan is back out here in California. I think he's down the street here at the Express Isle, one of the Piggly Wiggly. Didn't he say he was coming by tonight? Or uh, he may I stop by. Kidding. President Reagan may stop by. We never know who's going to fall by this show. You, you never know. But uh, along with President Bush, of course, comes Vice President Dan Quayle. Okay? <laughs> And th this guy has certainly had a lot of wonderful intelligent statements that he's made through the course of the campaigning over the last few years. And, but he's right there in the office ready to go to work now. You know, we thought it would be a great comedy bit to have what Dan Quayle said on the show every week and just kind of, uh, kind of map that. Then we decided this is a lot more serious than making fun of. Uh, we'd better take a serious look at that. And that, why, that is why here immediately at my left, I guess it would be, and Scooter, can you see this okay? That'd be my right. We have the Dan Quayle, what Dan Quayle said, conversion wheel. Now this is a little heady, so let me explain it to you here, okay? Okay. What we do is, number one, we take what Dan Quayle said uh, sometime in the preceding week or sometime that he said in the past. We then counter-reference that, uh, Scooter, with the current condition of President Bush and how he's feeling, his medical condition. Then we can open up our handy information window underneath and see just exactly how to react to that current situation. Let's try it out here. And would you certainly ask any questions if you have any along the way. 
Okay. You remember uh, Vice President uh, Quayle said during the campaign, I did not live in this century at one point. He said that. You remember that, so you, Scooter? But he didn't All right. live in this century. He didn't live in this century. If we take that statement and we then counter-reference with the current medical condition of President Bush, all right, uh oh, mysterious spot on the chest x ray for so, President Bush. So his uh -huh. health is a little, his, it is a serious. A here. little questionable on the health. We okay. then uh, pop out the handy information guide to see what we need to be doing. And we have here 360 days of sunshine, women generally attractive, and no military value. Or what that is, Scooter, is why to move your family to Easter Island on this one. Ah, All right? yeah. Yeah, so take care of that. All right, let's say that our former National Guard big buddy uh, has said something else, because he certainly did. He said at one time, he said, in charge, I'm in charge of the war on drugs. I don't know how you remember that or not. He did say that. All right, let's say he says that, Scooter, and then all of a sudden we find out that our president has sniffles and phlegm, but basically he's okay. All right? So uh, mm -hmm. his health is okay here. He, uh, Scooter, that is okay. right. Yeah, his health's okay. okay. So there's not a lot of worry here. Let's take a look at our handy guide and see what happens on the drug scene then. $5 per ounce. That's the price of cocaine on the street. Police stations, army bases, anywhere. That's where you could buy the cocaine. And I thought Graham meant grandma. That's the new anti-drug slogan that Vice President Quayle has come out with. So, so. we got here, if, if he's semi-sick and you can buy drugs now. This is right, okay. yes. Uh -huh. Now, uh, uh, finally, of course, we have uh, the, the very popular statement that was made, and it was, he knows more about nuclear arsenals than anybody in the Senate. That was actually said by our Vice President at one time. Let's now line up a very serious thing when we find that President Bush is bleeding from the ears. Yes, okay. I think we're in trouble now, don't you, now, Scooter? This is very serious. This His is pretty is serious. Yeah. In so let's take a look inside the we handy can, information. We should something here. Yeah, and uh, here we go. 20 years, risk, monopoly, stratego, and 1750. What we have here, folks, and take notes on this if you'd like. 20 years is the amount of time we'll have to spend underground, Scooter. Risk, monopoly, and stratego are great games to play for 20 years. And 1750, that's the retail cost of a case of spam to take with you. And so there it is. It's the incredible. Bush quail conversion wheel. For a transcript of what I just said, forget it, okay? <laughs> you know, um, so uh, what I'd like to say, uh, really uh, the motto of all of this is, is President Bush, and we know you are watching, and you folks who do see President Bush, make sure he wears his galoshes, make sure he looks both ways when he crosses the street, and make sure he doesn't eat any fatty foods. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of foods, I'm a little hungry. Anybody hungry here? Yeah. Oh. yeah! All right, let's do it. Tonight we're going to dial up. Do I have a menu? Yes, I certainly do. I have all my life wanted to try broasted chicken. I've never done that. There's a place in town here called Annie's Broaster Chicken. Actually, it's broasted chicken, too. It's written both ways, so we'll talk to Annie about that. Uh, everybody up for a little broasted chicken? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Let's give her a call. And uh... Hey, uh, Dick, we lost a wheel there. Did we? Oh, well, that's done. That's history. Hey, we, we'll kick that around all night. All right, let me dial up again here. Uh, how about, it looks like a pretty good broasted chicken. They've got uh, rolls and slaw. And uh, what else they got? Broasted potatoes. That uh, could be great on a cold uh, winter night. How many of you are there? About f looks like about 40 of you. Let's do it. <clears throat> Here, let me hold this up so we can... Maybe we'll get a deal if I hold this up. Hello, Annie's Broaster. Hi, Annie's Broaster. This is Dick Wilson over at Camp Midnight, the TV show. How you doing? Okay. Hey, can you uh, gather up a bunch of chickens and throw them in the broaster and get them over here for us for a little food tonight? Uh, about what time? Oh, gosh, you know, we can use it at any time. Uh, I'll tell you, you get it cooking and head it over this way, and if we need to, we'll send some cars over to pick it up, okay? Okay, sounds good. All right, good. there you go. You know where we are, Camp Midnight Studios, and Annie's Broaster. Is it Broaster or Broaster? There's an argument in the studio. Annie's Broaster. I win. Thank you. I win $100,000. We'll see you in a little bit. Thanks okay, a lot. how many people? Oh, oh, 40, 40. Okay, okay, 40. All right, there you go. All right. I'll tell you what we're going <laughs> to... Woo. All right, food's on its way, folks. When you hear that sound, you know that the fax machine is going here on the studio set. And we have little known facts we'd like to share with you right now. Matter of fact, these are just, ooh, this paper is, yeah. This paper is still warm. 
And uh, oh, these are actual stories that actually happen uh, in America, and they are sent to us. First off, we have uh, to Dick Wilson from Lenny Pischel of the USA Network. Love the show, babe. Think you're the best. Everything's great. Please read the USA programming announcement. <clears throat> All right. Saturdays at 2 p.m., don't miss the Brady Bunch, the lost episodes. This week, <laughs> this week Greg accidentally impregnates Marsha in a backyard free-for-all. Woo! Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Okay, hey, here's what I mean. Park rangers at Natural Bridge National Monument in Utah were looking for the poacher who shot and killed Zeke the Coyote. This is true. Zeke, who was friendly with visitors and staff, was reportedly shot by a man after taking pictures of the coyote. Scooter, you were in Utah this past weekend, weren't you? Well, yeah, I was. Well, and don't you, aren't you kind of a naturalist? Don't you like to take photos? I, I like the outdoors. I like it a lot. Uh, yeah, so what um, are you getting at? Could you show me the camera you use? Uh... It's a standard camera you can buy in any really? store. Uh -huh. It's a 35, uh, cal I mean, cal I mean uh, millimeter, 35 millimeter. It's yeah, a, please, it's, put that, yeah, put that thing down. It's, uh, put that. Yeah, I, I take a snapshot. No, no, thanks. Really? No, no, no. I'll could. have them done later someplace. Thanks. Good golly. Uh, a British, have we got time to do a couple more of these, do you think? We got, uh, you know, one or two minutes? That's too much time. Okay. <laughs> a British woman who wrote to a snack manufacturer to complain about her discolored potato chips received this reply. This is really true. It is difficult to say whether this is due to a process of active migration of the anticyanin from the periderm and cortex or to the primary projection within the flesh of the tuber. That's what she got back from the potato chip company. That's funny. I, I recently wrote to a, a snack company and complained about something, and the letter I got back said, bite my crank, you big pinhead. So, Whoa. Um, I guess that's the difference between Britain and America, huh? Okay, well, all right, there is little known facts. Hey, we got a fax number. If you want to send us something, it's 818-843, is that it? I'm looking here, 843-FAXS. That's it, the Camp Midnight View. We'll be back in a minute with Bud Court. <laughs> Camp Midnight. I'm Dick Wilson, your, your host for the evening. Thanks for being with us. Our next guest, though he will always be remembered for his uh, hilarious portrayal of Ruth Gordon's love interest in the uh, comedy classic Harold and Maude, our first guest is actually a world-renowned stage screen and uh, radio actor. Uh, he's uh, featured as a, a delightfully memorable teacher in the current release called The Chocolate War. Ladies and gentlemen, please say hello to Bud Court. Bud, come on up. <laughs> There's your microphone right there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's great, bud. You know, it, it, you're a busy guy. You do the TV and the radio and the movies. I mean, uh, and now you've got the new movie out. Tell us a little bit about the Chocolate War. Uh, it, oh, it's a loud Ooh, little, yeah, uh, huh? little. Well, see, we're broadcasting out to the road. We couldn't get all the people in that wanted to see you. I get it. I get it. Uh, the Chocolate War. It's a sweet movie. Yeah. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Okay. The Chocolate War. It's a. It's a very interesting kind of a film. It's dr drama, comedy. Uh, it's kind of like uh, Lord of the Flies a little bit. Uh, it's a first effort by wonderful young director Keith Gordon, who I believe is here tonight, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm real proud of, of the film and my work in it. I have a little kind of tip of the hat in the picture, but uh, it, it's funny. You know, I, I was raised in Catholic schools myself, so it's kind of a chance to... Uh, Brought a few things home, huh? Yeah, yeah. and also uh, got to kick butt a little bit for some of the teachers <laughs> that I uh, remembered with a certain fondness and uh, hysterical uh, demeanor. Well, you brought a clip along. Why don't you set up what we're going to see? What are we going to see in this clip from the Chocolate War? Well, there's this gang in school who kind of run the school, and uh, uh, they want to get back at a certain teacher, so they figure they're going to freak him out. And uh, the problem is that the teacher kind of gets wind of it before, so he actually ends up freaking them out. All right, Bud Court in The Chocolate War. Let's take a look. Right, yeah. <laughs> the Chocolate War. Bud Court. You must have wore those extras out that day, huh? Yes, we did. Yeah, we did certainly you, did. Did you have any teachers like that that had a good time in class? Well, I had the Christian Brothers of Ireland, and actually they were, they were pretty remarkable people. 
I got a two on my geometry regions, and I cheated. I copied from the guy who sat in front of me. <laughs> got one right on part one, and uh, the principal, I used to be an artist, and he had a nude uh, sketch that I had done in his office, and he called me, and he said, look, uh, I know you got a two, but I'm going to pass you, but just uh, don't ever take a math course again, and I'll be <laughs> keeping the sketch for the rest of the year, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we might be able to use you on the Camp Midnight accounting team at some uh, point, too, if you don't mind. Yeah. Hey, uh, over the holidays, it was such a nice surprise to see you on a Twilight Zone episode. Yes, a surprise yeah. for me, too, uh, hopping out of that trunk. I always loved the Twilight Zone. Yeah. You know? They did 11 new episodes this year, so it was tell, a big well, this story, and Tell them just you. a little bit about what you did. It was well, I play this kind of schleppy uh, clerk and uh, behind a hotel, and everyone kind of makes fun of him. You know, he's got big butt and stuff, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, he, uh, he finds his trunk, and he can get anything he wants with his trunk. So uh, he kind of uh, gets a chance to wield some power for the first time in his life. And uh, he actually, though, is kind of a nice character yeah. so he wasn't real mean with his power he used we won't tell him the end in case they see it in reruns right okay right. all right hope good. you do my count and ho ho my count <laughs> hopes you do also. i understand you're mm. rehearsing a new uh, play here in los angeles yeah right i'm real excited about this i'm doing a play with tom waits and carol kane and uh Ooh. bill pullman yeah. new play by thomas babe called demon wine that's not w-h-i-n-e but w-y-n-e and uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually, it, it's a pretty serious play about, about the homeless, which I, I've been interested in for, for a long time. And uh, it, it's really remarkable. We open on the 10th of February, and we're going to be at the LATC Los Angeles Great. Theater Good. Center downtown. All right. Okay. Cutting you up. If you know where we are here, if there's any extra free tickets, you know, you, got uh, it. you send Absolutely. them right over here, bud, Dick. we'll do it. You, you know, it. I do a radio show back in Kansas City, but I don't do any acting. I just get on there and talk. You've done some radio acting. What is, what's that involved in doing that? Well, it's real interesting. I'm a member of a, a theater group called the L.A. Classic Theater Works, and uh, it's about 36 actors, John Lithgow, Stacey Keach, Richard Dreyfuss, mm -hmm. uh, Marsha Mason, uh, Bonnie Bedelia, on and on and on. And uh, we haven't actually begun performing yet, but to get our chops together. This was actually, actually Richard Dreyfuss' idea. We're reading plays, and we've done about five or six in conjunction with the BBC and uh, different places yeah. out here. We've okay. done uh, The Crucible and uh, Are You Now or Have You Ever Been? Uh, I did Oh Dad, Poor Dad with Marion Mercer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun. You have to put a lot of energy into your voice. You know, in, in, with a camera, you can be a little more subtle but just working with your voice you have to act yeah, a lot sure. more oh, you have yeah. to be a lot bigger than yeah. you would normally be yeah well you know we've loved you and everything you've done you're a busy guy keep the good stuff coming we still like seeing harold and maude we look forward to seeing the stuff in the future and do this sign one of our styrofoam cups for us sure. and would you put a dental imprint in the edge there just in case we need it for identification <laughs> someone say well, if it's really your autograph okay there you go just bite on it bite on it and then sign your name that's what we do Everybody's done this, Bud. We're not trying to put you on the spot here. There he goes. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Bud Court. We'll be back in a minute with funny man John Campanera. Yeah. here on a Friday night. You know, we've got uh, a very special, it, it's, it's really kind of fun. We've got a very special backstage environment here, don't we? Oh, yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, movie producers, we're ready. Call us, okay? We can show up on your set immediately. We've got a couple of small, uh, small cars here we'll all pile in. Last week, we continued with our amassing of information on the items and words that sound like they're dirty, but they're really not. Uh, yeah, we've had some more sent in, and I'd like to share some of those with you as we move. And, and we, as the Camp Midnight staff, feel like it is our charge, our heed, our steed, our stead to move forward and have these for you. Um, first off, uh, let's see, this one is sent in. Do I have the card here? Where did I have it? Okay, here it is, right here. I want to get the name of this person because they have done a wonderful job. Uh, wait a minute, don't look ahead. <laughs> Our first word comes from Miss Jordan Salinger of Malibu, California. She sent in the word that sounds dirty but really isn't, ball cock. <laughs> yeah, that's a good hey, Dick, okay. hey, Dick. Oh, please. Hey, Dick. Yeah. Whose uh, yeah. ball cock is that? <laughs> what? 
Does that belong to the segment producers? I don't, yeah, we've got to get this back to the office because uh, we can't flush without this back of the office. So, all right. The next one I have. Ooh, this is one. I've practiced this word for a couple of days since we got this one in. The second word comes to us uh, all the way from Gross Point Woods, Michigan. Uh, Mr. Jerry Deeney writes the word sexagisma. Ooh. Uh -huh. This is actually, now this actually is the second Sunday before Lent, January 29th, coming up. Sex, let's say it together, folks. Sexagisma. Okay, that's good. Yeah, that's pretty good. I, you know, I'm, I'm milking you a little bit. Um, we got time for another one? Okay, let's do another one here, because this is, this is interesting also. Things that sound dirty but aren't, in case you just joined us. Uh, our third thing that sounds dirty but really isn't comes to us from Mr. Matt McDaniel of Orlando, Florida, and it is... Kuntosh. That's a Ooh. good one, huh? That's a good one in all ways. Again, once again, folks, we do encourage you to send us, if you would, things that sound dirty but aren't. Here's our address at Camp Midnight. It's Camp Midnight, Post Office Box 189, Hollywood, California, 978. Uh, or you can fax us the information. Yes, we have a fax machine. Thank you. 818-843-FAXS. Uh, and if you do this, if you send it and we use it, on the show, we will send you a picture of Peter O'Toole that we found <laughs> around the office. Now listen, yeah. one, 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 one very important thing. Now this is, is the only picture we have, so if you aren't the first that sends us, you'll be receiving uh, copies on the machine of, of Peter O'Toole that we'll send out to you. Uh, you know, there's a funny guy backstage, and I talked to him before, and he's got some great stuff to talk to you about. Let's do it right now. Uh, his name is Joseph. Camp and I, well, uh, no, we don't tell you anything. Hang on a minute. Hang on. Joe, uh, stay back here. John, stay back. Okay, don't come anywhere. Because I want to tell you, you've seen him on Star Search. You've seen him live at the improv and uh, some of his regular appearances here at LA's Comedy Store if you're out in Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, it's John Campanera. Come on. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys sound great. <laughs> good. Spokesperson for the group. Huh? Well, I wish I had felt half as good. I got these post-holiday blues. A lot of people get depressed during the holidays. They call it the holiday blues syndrome or lonely whatnot. I always get depressed right after the holidays. It's called Visa MasterCard syndrome. <laughs> you ever open up your bill in January? It's like, hello, wake up call, party's over with. 150 bucks for a sweater. What was I thinking about? I don't even like her that much. What was her name again? Oh, uh, well, I got some nice gifts for Christmas. I can't complain. Got the Jeopardy home game. <laughs> I got the special LA version of them. You had categories like freeway shootings for 100, illegal alien lottery winners for 500. <laughs> Who was Rodriguez? Uh, but uh, it's one of the few shows I could watch, Jeopardy. You know what I can't take are these daytime talk shows, like Geraldo and uh, Oprah. You notice they're turning into freak shows, these programs? <laughs> the, the, these, co these guys aren't controversial. They're freaks. I mean, do you know a Nazi skinhead lesbian nun? No, I don't either. Where do they find these people? You couldn't create these groups if you wanted to. Ripley wouldn't believe these people. You know? I think they're all actors myself. I do. I think the director comes in every day, there's a bunch of actors backstage at Donnie. He says, okay, today we need an albino hunchback midget. Who can play it? Anybody? <laughs> Webster, okay, get in the makeup. You'll be on a little while. <laughs> well, what's funny are the teasers, the quick commercials for these shows. You know, sometimes you're watching television half hazardly, you're reading the paper. And it's like out of nowhere you hear homosexual priests who are secretly married at four on Donnie. He's like, what the hell was that? <laughs> it's worse than the Inquirer. Incestuous Mormons with gum disease at three. I know, but it's like, what the? Uh, she's lost a lot of weight, Oprah, have you know? She looks funny to me now, though. She looks weird. I'd rather, I liked her better fat, because now she's got this skinny body, but she's got that big head to get down with, you know? <laughs> she looks like Casey Kasem. <laughs> Hi, I'm Casey Casey, and I'll be right back with my big head right after these messages. 
Well, I'm just happy I'm not the next guy that has to fight Mike Tyson. That's all I could say. You think he doesn't have a few problems he wants to hammer out on somebody? <laughs> I wouldn't suggest wearing a Robin Givens mask, you know? It could work against you. I don't feel sorry for Mike. I tell you, a boxer I feel sorry for is the Olympic boxer that missed his fight. He missed the bus to his fight. You know how disappointing this is to me? Here's a guy who trains four years for a fight, man. Every day, running, boxing, sparring, training, running, boxing, sparring, training. The day of truth finally comes along, and it's like, Holy smokes! I missed my bus! Ah, nuts! <laughs> Ain't this a bitch? Four years down the pipe, I'll be a monkey's uncle. I mean, you got guys like Sugar Ray Leonard, he's articulate, he's trying to rid the boxer's image of being dumb, and this guy goes and sets it back another hundred years. <laughs> I missed my bus. I read the schedule wrong. I read the schedule wrong. Sorry, I messed up. I mean, it's, it's funny, but it's sad, because this guy, he can go on to be the next Muhammad Ali. And his whole life, he's going to be known as, hey, you're the dude that missed the bus. The Olympics, right? I thought that. Honey, let's take a picture. It is him, the Olympic guy. They'll never let him live it down. His whole life, people be walking up to him. By the way, you got the time? <laughs> I'm only kidding. Well, it's a joke. I know who you are. Get out of here. I know what time it is. You're Olympic guy, right? Hey, you wouldn't happen to know when the next bus is coming. By the <laughs> I'm teasing. Get out of here. Right? You're the Olympic guy, right? I know who you are. Go on. But it's a good, <laughs> what a scandalous Olympics, though, wasn't it? Everyone was on drugs at Olympic. It's a good thing they have drug testing at the Olympics. I mean, imagine if they didn't. I mean, imagine the records they break that day. <laughs> You'd have guys running the mile in a minute. Hit the buzzer. Just hit the gun. I'm ready to go. Hit the gun. I'll run it twice. I don't give a damn. Just hit the gun. <laughs> I mean, the hardest thing would be just trying to line up everybody for the race. <laughs> Will you guys quit jacking around and get on the starting line? I don't care. I'll give me a head start. Just hit the gun. I want to go. I want to go now. Hit the gun. Hit the gun. Then I'll do the marathon. I know the cat's line. Thank you very much. You guys have been excellent. Thank you. John, all right. Here you go. There's a microphone for you right there. Hang it over the back there. Oh, John. Mm. Yeah, John. I got Whoa. another one for you. Mm. Kumquat. Ooh. <laughs> oh, I, I just yeah. heard you talking about that. Yeah. Hey, hey, get cans, that down. You got it? Of... Okay, kumquat. Scratch that on the wall over there. That's a good one. Why did we think of that? Ooh. <laughs> that Olympics, it was full of stuff, wasn't it? Oh, that, was like, that was really something. Uh, you know, I, I want to apologize real quickly. I think I may have mentioned the word George while I was in your introduction, but the reason was I was thrown off by that sexagisma thing. It's a religious <laughs> term that we heard. So, John, thanks for that. I'll get you every time. You don't like the trace TV shows, huh? They don't do anything for you. Well, it's a lot of sensationalism, I think. Yeah. I think if they really want to find some nuts, they just pick up the paper, the LA Times. Right. I read a few <laughs> weeks ago, some lady got in an argument with her boyfriend. She cooked this pet parrot. Yeah. Did, you, did you read about that? I, I'm not making this. No. I swear to God, and I'm thinking, all I could think of, here's a guy, goes out and gets another parrot right away, you know, to relieve his pain. In the meantime, they make up, right? So now every time she comes over, the parrot's like, ah, don't argue with her. <laughs> no fighting. <laughs> ah, don't piss her off. <laughs> <laughs> what, I mean, there's so many nuts out there. Well, I was in yes. Chicago over holidays for Christmas. Some guy gets killed. Some nut dropped the boulder off the overpass onto the freeway, goes through the guy's windshield, kills him coming home from a fishing trip. That's how senseless parties can be. I'm thinking, here's a guy probably out fishing all day, not catching a damn thing, thinking, you know, I got a better chance of getting hit with a boulder out of the sky today <laughs> than catching a God-blessed fish. And wouldn't you know it? Mm. <laughs> It's a sick world. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you're, you're all over. You, you've been in stand-up stuff for how long now, John? How long have you been? Uh, nine years. Nine years? You started out yeah. in Chicago. How'd you get into it initially? What, what said, hey, I can do this? You know, I can stand up and do this. Believe it or not, I, I won a, a, you know, when the gong show was real popular? Mm -hmm. yeah. They had local contests around my house back in 79. Mm -hmm. 
And I entered one one day. Uh, I did a few impressions. I used to do impressions. Mm -hmm. And I, I won like $500. Ooh. And I figured, hey, maybe I got a shot at this. <laughs> and then I won another one about a month later at another local bar around Chicago. And I said, uh, and then people tried to tell me, well, there's a couple of local comedy clubs. You should check it out. So I figured, so hey, why not give it a shot? Let's well, see some impressions. You, you, no, well, yeah, I, uh -huh. you got a bad impression I, I, you can I do for I us? I started or? doing... No, I just I got into comedy because, uh, because the impressions you... people start labeling you after a while. Yeah. They'd bring you up. Oh, here's a fine impressionist, and you, uh, and you go out there, and they all they want to hear is impressions. Yeah. And if you're brought out as a comic, then they go. Were you the kind that had to tell people who you were doing? Yeah. You did? <laughs> okay, John. Yeah, Lee. yeah, right. But then they turn they, they turn around and go, it goes something like this, and they turn around, and they look just the same when they come back. It's like. <laughs> well, John, when we pull the old styrofoam cup out, you know we're about out of time on this part. So what we want you to do, if you would please. Well, bite, it. bite the cup, or we can get your dental imprint on it. This is what we do, and then if you'd autograph it, we'd love it. We'd like to put it on our wall. Is that okay? Sure. All right, just All take right. a little bite of it. Sure, I'm a key. Yeah. Take a bite. Yeah, just put it. Yeah, just put it in print. Sign up. John Campanera, everybody. John Campanera. Thank you. We'll be right back. USA's Camp Midnight will be right back after these important messages. All right, this is great. Someone want to get me a towel? Well, welcome back to Camp Midnight, folks. Hey, uh, you know, there's so much going on in the fragrance world these days. There are so many major stars who have taken on a, fra a fragrance themselves, and they use themselves to pitch it, and the fragrance, so I guess, smells like them or something, uh, shares uninhibited Elizabeth Taylor's passion just for a couple. There's a lot of other people getting into this right now. We've brought from Petite Jean Cosmetics, Victoria Standish. She's going to show us some of the other people that got into it. Victoria, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you know, it is just such a kick to be here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, what, what do you have for us? All right, well, the first scent that I have was created by a man who is very, very funny. And he is not just an actor or comedian. He's also a humanitarian. Mm -hmm. This is Jerry Lewis's sheer brilliance. Oh, really? Let me just take a... You know, it smells a bit, to me, like uh, a bus driver's underwear. <laughs> Well, that's what everyone in America thinks, but it's very big in France. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. What's next here? What's, uh, what's this one right here? Well, this next one was created by a young lady who's had a very difficult time of it lately, mm -hmm. but has a lot of hoods and spunk. Mm -hmm. And that would be Robin Givens, and it's called Really Very Nice. Oh, yeah, sure, I'll bet. Yeah, uh, really, I'll bet. Somebody's taking a bath on that one, yeah. Get that out of here, okay. What else have you got here? What's next? Here are bad. Yeah. All right. Here, what's this? What are you going to do with this thing? Well, why is it, why this... do we have rubber gloves on oh, the set? Oh, I'm Scooter? coming to that. Uh, yeah. This is exciting because it's for men or women, and it's created by that very hard-working heavy metal band, Guns N' Roses. Oh. And it's called Burning Sensation. <laughs> Ooh, uh-huh. No, 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 I'll pass on that one, okay? Yeah, what, what's, what else has it got on there? Well, with? Burning Sensation also comes with another Petite Jean cosmetic product called No Scabs, Milady. Okay. All right. <laughs> Good. What? And what that is, it's an ointment. Oh, is it really? Yes. You put it right on? Mm -hmm. What is this on the floor here? Well, what do I have This here? is a lot of fun. This mm -hmm. is a lot of fun. This is for the actress Shelley Winters, and it's an, it's an after-bath splash called the Big Easy. Uh-huh. How much does this cost per ounce? What's the... Well, we don't sell this one by the ounce. Yeah. We sell it by the gallon. Mm -hmm. um, this is the handy travel size, good for a long weekend. And it's, it's available in stores in 5, 10, and 55-gallon drums. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. The Big Easy. What is this last one over here by okay. itself? What's well, this? This... Wait a minute. Yeah, what is that? This one is really, really the kicker. It's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. It was created for our very special little vice president, Mr. Dan Quayle. Mm. And it's called... Heartbeat away. <laughs> the bottle is empty, though. Well, yes, they all come that way, but people seem to buy it anyhow. All right, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Victoria Standish, Petite John. Hey, can you hang around and help John. me? Uh, hang around and help me maybe serve some food here. I think the food's going to be here in a minute. Matter of fact, Annie's Broaster Chicken is here. It's eating time. Yeah. Whoa. 
Oh, bring it out here. Put it right on out here. That's wonderful. Hey, come on up and eat, folks. Come on up and get what you like. No, I don't want to knock any food over. Yeah. Come on up and have a little something if you'd like. Sure. Just uh, don't be shy. Step right on up here. That's real good. And let me just grab uh, somebody real quick here. Let me grab. Uh, uh, yeah, come on up here. Sir, come on, come right up here for just a moment. Stand right over here and uh, look right into this camera right here. Your name, please. My name is Tom Buckley. Tom, and where are you from? I'm from Kansas City. Yeah, Tom's from Kansas City, huh? Yeah, yes, sir. Good. Well, thanks. Tom, what I wanted to, while you're eating, we also show a music video while you're dining, all right? That's great. We call it the Network Stipulation Video. Uh, the USA Network makes us do this. And tonight, we have for your uh, viewing pleasure, uh, it's called Frontline Assembly's Body Count. And what we want to do is ask you, who's the guy under the sheet? That's your video question. Tom, eat up, okay? Okay. And welcome to California. Thank you very much. All right, there you go. Let's roll it. Uh, it's just me, the dick man. We'll be back in a minute with Susan Normandia from the L.A. Zoo. Well, welcome back to Camp Midnight, everybody. And uh, besides being a wonderful lady, our next guest satisfies Article 15, Paragraph 27 of the International Television Codes for television slash talk slash music shows that says at some point in your broadcasting career you need to have a lady on that brings cute animals in. And so um, we are covering that tonight above and beyond the call of duty with a wonderful girl. She's Susan Normandia of the L.A. Zoo. Come on out here. How may I hold and help here while you put your... Can I do this? You can hold them. Oh. This is a European hedgehog, and actually they're very common in Europe, and they live in gardens uh, or in farms, and they are known to keep pests away. They eat right. snails and insects, so they're... Actually, farmers sometimes even put a little dish of food out for them to yeah. keep them coming back and forth let me, to uh, there. Let me turn him so he gets a good, good face shot. I'll get my thumb out of the way. Oh. Look at that little guy, huh? Oh. Yeah. How old is this Hedgehog. Oh, it's is about it? five years old. Is it? Five years. Oh, that's really and if you lay, put him down flat. Can he go down? Yeah, we'll see if he'll... He if hurts he'll... just a little bit, you know. He's, he's a little sticky. So normally he'd walk around and he has, you can see these are spines on his back and these are a kind of hairs, but actually they work to protect the animal mm -hmm. from uh, any predators, which might be something like a fox. And when it's afraid, it would either run into a hedge you know mm -hmm. why they call it a hedgehog, mm -hmm. or it might stand up the spines on its back, or its final defense would be to roll into a ball like this. And oh. it has a muscle all around here <laughs> that helps it to do that. It's kind so of like. So it can close it face up completely also, huh? Yeah, it's kind of like the drawstring on a pants. Don't be turned. You know, one question I have about this with it being so needly and so pointy and so painful for us to hold, let's say this hedgehog has a date. Okay, <laughs> and uh, let's say that the old Spanky McNasty trick comes up at some yeah. point. How do they do that? Actually, uh, the uh, yeah. the hedgehog female has the choice. Does she? Uh, Usually, if that's she the way it chooses is. Yeah. not, <laughs> if she chooses not to mate, she just needs to stand up her spine, yeah. spines. Yeah. If she chooses to mate, she just flattens out her spine, mm -hmm. and then the male mounts her and he holds on to her spines. Does he? Yeah. so that he doesn't slide off because it's real slippery mm. and then mates with her some of you may want to try that later uh, <laughs> and i know you gentlemen can use that information to your betterment well thanks great thank you mr hedgehog i read about you as a child okay, well, now, uh, okay, okay. we'll put him away put him in his little garage and uh <laughs> you folks in the front row uh our next item that we bring up from the L.A. Zoo is something that we all know and love. Yes, a lady is about to eat her napkin here on the front row. She said she saw this bag wiggling, so uh, Susan just dive right in there and let's take a look. Well, an easy way to transport a snake is in a bag like this. Mm -hmm. And this, right. uh, this is a young boa constrictor. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Now these, okay, now these... Uh, once again, a boa constrictor is only dangerous if it hugs you, is that right? Right, and this, yeah. uh, boa constrictors are obviously non-venomous snakes. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they, they kill their prey by actually wrapping around them. Okay, there we go. Uh, and they throw coils around them, as right now there's a coil around my 
with my hand. And what they do is kind of if you're wearing a belt and you just tighten your belt and tighten your belt till you can hardly breathe anymore, mm -hmm. what they actually do to their prey is they wrap around it and every time the animal exhales, mm -hmm. they get tighter so that eventually the animal is unable to breathe. It's interesting because you think of snakes being slimy, but it's, it's very dry. It's, you know, it's, not a, it's not an oily, slimy feel, is it? No, it's a beautiful, beautiful feel. And actually, it's quite cool uh, yeah, unless the nice. animal has been in the sun, where uh, then it would be a whole lot warmer. I, I think I'll take this one with me. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> no. uh, well, let's see what else you've got here. Thank you. Do these do animals have names at all? Do you name your animals at the zoo? Um, we do. If the animal is adopted, which there's a program at the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association where you can adopt an animal, you don't get to take it home, but you do get to name mm -hmm. it. Uh, and that's the way they get their names. But snakes okay. really don't have ears, if you notice. So it wouldn't matter to him if he had a okay. name or not. Well, what else did you bring for us? Well, it goes back in the bag. How many times, folks, have you wanted to be carried in a bag some ways? Wouldn't that be great sometimes? Just, yeah, put me in the bag and take me home, huh? Okay. Now, I have uh, this next animal I, I have seen before we, we did the show. So this is, this is the good, uh, this is the warm and fuzzy one right here. This is the cute right one. The cute yeah. one, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, hedgehog's cute. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Hedgehog, you were cute. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ooh. Now, what is this? This is a red ruffed lemur. It's been a while since I've had my red ruffed also, matter of fact. <laughs> uh, native to Madagascar. And as you can see, it's got a real long tail, long arms and legs. And this animal lives in the, the canopy, the high forest of the tropical rainforest. So mm -hmm. trees like 200 feet tall would be its home. Gosh, yeah. Come, come on over here. Look at the hands. It's almost like human-like hands on the lemur, isn't it? Very human-like. It's uh, actually a very... <laughs> Good. Yeah, he's very, a great he, he, job. he grips very nice, yeah. Yeah. Uh, lemurs are primitive primates, so you could say that they are way, one, one of the ancestors of, of monkeys and apes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see that they have beautiful hands like people, yeah, and you can do. see how he holds on, and that enables him to hold on to trees where he, where he lives. Yes, he's, he's giving me the view of the whole body here, I can see. That's very nice. Thank you. Yes, I've seen that. Thank you very much. <laughs> where are you going to go? Are they sacred, considered sacred in some places? They're considered sacred, and uh, the natives of Madagascar have thought of them as sacred because sometimes they'll sit in the sun. You want to turn around and show how you'd sit in the sun? No. Uh, they'll sit in the sun with their arms out and their legs mm -hmm. out and just absorb sun. So our uh, natives have thought of them as worshippers, worshipping the sun. Is an animal this cute, does it have any enemies in the world? Well, right now the enemies are people in that the trees that they live in are being felled. They're being cut down for uh, timber and also uh, to make room for cropland. Mm -hmm. So in that way, they have those enemies. That's where they're enemy. Well, Susan, thank you for bringing all of our friends over from the L.A. Zoo. Come back and see us again. Susan Normandia and a wonderful little lemur there. We'll be back in a minute, folks, with Keith Gordon. Susan Normandia of the L.A. Zoo. We hope to have Susan back again to bring some more of the great animals from the Los Angeles Zoo. Well, despite his youth, our next guest has a long and impressive list of credits. He starred in movies like uh, Christine and uh, Dressed to Kill, also Back to School. He's also made his directorial debut in the movie The Chocolate War. Folks, it's Keith Gordon. Come on out, Keith. Yeah, 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 yeah. How you doing there, guy? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you. You know, Steve, it's, thanks it's, for having me. It, well, we, well, great. You know, it's it's. Whenever I say uh, I start feeling my age, when I say a guy who's so young, but okay, how young are you, Keith? I'm 27. 27 years yeah. old. All right. Well, that's not too bad. No. no. How long ago did you start getting into the acting field? Well, I actually started acting in theater in New York when I was about 15. Uh, although, before, even before that, I wanted to make movies. I mean, that was an obsession from real, real early on. What but was the movie that you saw as a kid that said, yeah, I gotta do that? 2001. Yeah, I walked out of 2001 yeah. and I went, yeah. wow, I yeah. wanna do that one day. And, uh, but I didn't come from a family that had the money for me to go out and buy a 16 millimeter camera mm -hmm. and go do all that stuff. And 
I fluked into acting. I mean, it just sort of happened, and, and that was became a way to get back to making films, which is what mm -hmm. I wanted to do to start. Well, one of your first appearances when it was in All That Jazz, right? Yeah, what was that like? You worked with some great people in that. Well, uh, yeah, working for Bob Fosse was pretty amazing. I mean, it's real sad that he's gone now. I think he's one of the, the best directors that we had, both in film and, and in, in theater, and, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the part I begged for. That was, yeah. that, was a, that was a case of going in, and, you know, they wanted a blonde tap dancer, and I can't dance, and I'm dark, and I went in, and I was like, please, <laughs> let me do this. And the character you ended up playing was? Oh, course, I played the... Yeah. Uh, the young Roy Scheider, uh, right, yeah. who's tap dancing and is yeah. molested by the strippers backstage, ends yes, up uh, uh, ejaculating in his pants. Yes, it was a, thank you. It was no, there's a another word that yes. sounds dirty and, and is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, it was a, you know, a chance to work with some of the best people around. Well, we're all excited that you have written and directed the Chocolate War. Huh? You, had, you had Bud Court here. Well, we had Bud on. Yeah. I don't think, uh, you know, and, and we're not receiving anything from the Chocolate War people. It was just kind of really, coincidence. You didn't, you didn't get the check. I. <laughs> I guess the segment producers got the check. Oh, yeah, okay. I got a cut coming somewhere on this, yeah. <laughs> uh, how'd you get involved with this project? Well, I, I loved the book for about 10 years. It's based on a novel that's sold millions of copies over the years, and I fell in love with it as a teenager and uh, carried around with the thought of making it as a film one day. Uh, I produced and wrote this little film called Static, which never got released in America, but did very well in Europe which led this producer, Jonathan Crane, to say, well, what would you like to make as a first film? Mm -hmm. I told, brought him The Chocolate War. He said, it's great. If you can make it for $700,000, you can make it. Uh, and that's what we made it for. We went out and just scraped and did it by the skin of our teeth, but we made it, and uh, it, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. Well, good. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, we, we, you've got a clip. Did you bring a clip also? Yeah, we've got a clip. Let's see. Bud, Bud Cord brought a clip that, that he was involved. Let's see what the director chooses well, as his this, favorite th clip. This is now. the dark side of the film. The film's okay. got a real dark edge. I mean, it's Lord of the Flies or, or like Blue Velvet with Teenagers was another phrase that came to mind. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's supposed to be at this Catholic boys' school where this one kid won't take part in the chocolate sale, but it's really a metaphor for... Yeah larger society, whether it's Russia or the Pentagon or wherever people are pressured into doing things they don't want to do. And in this clip, this one kid who's not going along is uh, under pressure from uh, the gang in school that wants him to fit in and not make waves. All right, Keith Gordon, director of The Chocolate War. Let's take a look. All right, Woo! yeah, Woo. Chocolate War. But Keith, you... See, he's kind of a misfit, the lead character in this play. Were you, yeah. Was, was that you as a boy? You oh, a yeah, in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I dropped out of school when I was 16. Uh, I was not somebody who went along well with rules. And it's actually a lot like this character. I wasn't, I wasn't a rebel who was going around breaking windows and stuff, but I was a kid who just kept saying why. I kept questioning rules. And I guess that's what the film is about, is, you know, when you get to that point in your life, 15, 16, 18, whatever, you suddenly start looking at the system around you and you go, yeah, this is the way it is, but does it have to be? Mm -hmm. And I was that kind of kid, which drove my yeah. teachers and everybody real crazy. Well, you've worked with a lot of great people, Brian De Palma, John Carpenter and things, uh, along with Bob Fosse. Have they affected you at all? Oh, as far sure. As what you do? How oh, you that, do that was my film school, and it yeah. was the greatest film school in the world. You work with some of the best directors, and they are kind enough to answer your nauseating list of questions. And, you know, mm. I mean, somebody like Brian De Palma, who's such a, a visual stylist, you know, explaining why he picks a lens, why he puts in a camera in a place. I mean, what better education can you get? Yeah, and right. They were very kind and took a lot of time. What kind of tips would you give somebody out there who wants to be a director? This is wow. a question you get asked probably all the time. They want to be a director. What do they do? How do they get started? It's a tough road. Uh, make a film. Find a way. Get an 8 millimeter camera. Do anything you can. Work on movies, too. Mm -hmm. Whether it's as a production assistant for no pay, just being around it. There's nothing that's the equivalent of working on a film, seeing how it's done yeah. to give you that education. No film school can give you that. Yeah. One question that's been burning with me here ever since I knew you were on, uh, Dress to Kill, you were in that. Angie right. Dickinson, were you there when she did the shower scene with the soap coming off? <laughs> oh, God, uh, how I wish. Um, <laughs> yeah. Actually, the reality of that scene is that wasn't Angie's body. That was actually the penthouse pet of the years for that <laughs> year. Um, All right. But, okay. uh, but uh, I, I begged a lot. And, yeah, yeah. But nah. I'm going to still pretend it was her body when I watch it, though. I think so. Keith, uh, thanks for coming. Hey, I want you to sign one of our styrofoam cups. All right. As I have it here, as you can see on the back wall, all of our celebrities have put their dental imprints on it so we can identify it in the you future. You got it. What's he need to do, folks? Spider! That's right. If you'll do that and then sign it, we'd love it. Folks, Keith Gordon. Keith Gordon on Camp Midnight. I think so. We'll be back in a minute with Jackie Stallone.
night, folks. Welcome back. Nick Wilson, I'm your host. Glad you're spending your Friday night with us and, and, and love to have you. We've got a great show uh, next week also. I'd like to tell you who's going to be on. We've got Rick Dempsey, catcher for the L.A. Dodgers, coming in. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Carrie Mitchum will be here from the bold okay, and the beautiful. Wait a minute. Hold it. Ladies and gentlemen, wait a minute. Oh William God. Shatner. William Shatner is with us. Wait, hey. <laughs> William Shatner is... Bill, how are you? Good. What a surprise. Hey, here. Uh, here you go. We got, let's, get, let's get your mic here. Are you okay? You all right? Okay. What a surprise, folks. William Shatner. It's great, Dick. Great to be here. Oh, God. <laughs> what brings you here, Bill? Why are you here? Well, I mean, you know, I just got finished with... Uh, doing the set, you know, to uh, finish the episode of Star Trek V, and uh, yeah. it's fantastic, you know, we're having a rap party, lots of uh, DJs, discos, fantastic. Man, this is, well, how did the filming, uh, during Star Trek, how did the filming go, you know, after you're all done? Well, I'll tell you something, uh, you know, the fact is that, you know, when we started working on the show, you know, the, the very original bridge was rebuilt five different times. The bridge was completely rebuilt five different times, and uh, the other day, I, you know, I tried to sit down in the captain's chair, fell down, hurt my coccyx, and, uh, which uh, is a word you could use. It's on another yourself. dirty one, yeah. Uh, yeah uh -huh. hey. <laughs> hey, how's the family doing? How's everybody doing? Huh? It's great. Well, I'll tell you something. There's, you know, my daughter's ticking me off a little bit. I mean, you know, she's, uh, she's dating this punk, you know what I mean? He's a... This kid's an actor, right? You know what I mean? He's a lot of fun, but I'd say he's a punk, you know, but he's a, just he's a great kid. William Shatner, I know, Bill, I know you've got something very near and dear in your heart. You've worked on it for a long time. Oh. You're doing a special for public television. That's called, right. That's and right. I believe it's, uh, it's called The Emancipator. It is The Emancipator. Can you tell me about this? Well, it's part of a series that I've been doing for, uh, for the PBS uh, classics. I'm doing a one-man show of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, it's, uh, yes. it's been a very hard working wonderful. project. I guess, have you brought a clip? Did you bring a clip with you? I believe I have, if oh, uh, somebody wonderful. would like to. I, was, uh, I thought maybe you had, yeah. Uh, <laughs> could we roll? Look. Let's take a look. The Emancipator, William Shatner on public television. Let's look. Four score, seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth from this government a new nation devoted to the proposition that all men are created equal. Here, we resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God, dedicated to the proposition governed by the people, for the people, won't. Why? The people shall not perish from the earth. Coming by. No, I gotta I tell you, I gotta get out of here. Gotta get to the stables, do a little harness racing. But uh, uh, it's been yeah. wonderful to Bill, see you, Dick. Bill Fantastic. Shatner, William Shatner, folks, a surprise guest. We, we love it. Oh, 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 man, oh man. Ah, ah. Just a minute. Oh, mm. I gotta see. We'll try to find out when that's on PBS, and you can try to be out of town. Okay. You know, our next guest brought astrology to Harford and also Rocky Balboa to life and this to your living room. Here's your microphone. There we go. Here we go. My goodness. Ooh, that's some uh, a little bit of wild action there. I want you to give tell us a little bit about this, Jackie. Hollywood hits, huh? What's the story? Isn't that exciting? Mm. My female boxers. Where are they? Well, I, you, you bringing them to us, I guess, huh? Yeah, on the camera. Where do you find these ladies to do the, this type um, of thing? In gymnasiums. Mm -hmm. We put out auditions. We get about three to five hundred girls a week that want to be boxers, really? and our requirements are very high. They must be 36, 26, 36, not over 22 blondes. Yeah. Ooh, how many of you are looking for that, huh? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, we're book solid. 
What kind of training do they go through to get ready to be a part of the team? Uh, we train them, but they have to be pretty good athletically. Yeah. They have to work out in gyms. You just can't suddenly be sitting around looking at TV for years and decide to be a boxer. Uh -huh. It's the same type of training the boxers go through. It's, it's so much nicer to watch than you the old guys. You watch and see. Yeah, yeah, My sure. kid said he wouldn't get in the ring with them. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, speaking of your kid, you, got, you, you have begat talented kids, Jackie. You sure have. I mean, uh, Rocky Rambo Sylvester, and you got Frank, and you got the daughter also, Tony Ann. Yes. I mean, uh, where does all this talent come from? Well, I know What's where it, like it didn't raising come these from. people, huh? It didn't come from the father. Uh -oh. I'm going to take full uh -oh. credit. I really yeah. am. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I'm not going to take booze. I'm for the women. <laughs> <laughs> the men could just boo. What was it like around the house with all that gang growing up, huh? Uh, horrible. Yeah. 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 Horrible. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, I'm very happy to be here, incidentally, because my children were raised on Bandstand and Dick Clark. We're from Philadelphia. Yeah. And wow. they got straight F. Right up. Right, they got Clark. straight yeah. F's in school. Yeah, is he yeah, around he's, somewhere? Well, he's, 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 he's the executive producer, so he's, he's up paying, counting, he? the, counting the minutes somewhere. Well, he that better we're doing. be counting. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I think I owe him a lot of credit because my kids flunked school because they tore home every day to watch bandstand for hours. Yeah. Of course, they wore out of their shoes. <laughs> and but <laughs> now, and you know, they wanted to be on bandstand desperately and dance, but. Dick Clark just said they did, their feet didn't go in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. I wonder maybe I can get them a job now. <laughs> I really mean it. What, tell me about bringing astrology to Harford. I mean, uh, Harvard College? What is um, Haverford College. Haverford? And, and Temple. Haverford. What do you mean, Haverford? Haverford. Have it. Well, I've Philadelphia. Got, somebody wrote Harvard down here. Who did it? Yeah. Step forward. <laughs> One of the segment producers. Well, you just lost it, your it's, cut. It's yeah. in Harvard as well. Yeah, okay. No, actually. I started teaching astrology in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I was so bored with marriage, I didn't know what to do. So, uh, and still am. <laughs> so, yeah. I decided my children were not, uh, first I put it in high school, my children were not doing too well in school at all. So, the only way I could keep the truant officers on key and the teachers were, I promised to do their horoscopes. Uh -huh. So, my kids got fairly, they still got Fs. But the <laughs> fact is, they didn't get thrown out of school. So, eventually, I, uh, some of these teachers graduated and became professors in some of the colleges. I kept up their charts, so it was an opening. I did put astrology in the colleges. Yeah, all right. Well, look for Now it's in all of the colleges. Oh, yeah, yeah. All At right. At the time, they thought I was just one of these crazy mothers. <laughs> I hope you'll look forward and, and find something good for Camp Midnight, the show. And, Jackie, we want to thank you for coming on. Would you mind signing one of our Styrofoam cups? Oh, I don't eat, eat a cup Would you do that? Huh? Would you bite a cup for us? Huh? Is that all right? Bite. Just to, let us see your imprint there for just a moment. Put a little lipstick on it, because we haven't had a lot of people with lipsticks on the... Oh, yeah. All right. Sign that. Jackie Stallone, folks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bardo is next. You like him? on the set of my new project, The Emancipator. USA's Camp Midnight will be right back after these messages. I've got work to do. Wilkes Booth, you punk! Next, we'd like to welcome two very young, talented ladies singing their fourth single, Hold Me, Hold Me, from their album, Bold as Love. Please welcome Enigma recording artist, Bardo. Way. Ah, there's a microphone here behind you, behind both of you. There's a microphone. Whoa, you know, the hardest two working girls on this show, I can tell you that. Yeah. Bardo, wonderful. All right, well, we're going to have roll call here. Let's identify Acacia. Acacia. Acacia and Jazz. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. That's one of those words. Yes, <laughs> Dick is one of those words also. <laughs> Sounds dirty, but we'll listen to an offer, okay? Yeah. Like, uh, what a great song. That's right. I like a song Thank that you. cuts right through all the crud and gets right to the point. <laughs> That's kind of where we are. <laughs> what are you doing these days? You're working in the studio? Are you back in the studio? Uh, this week we go into the studio and start our second album. Ooh. All right, good. <laughs> all right. Any a title yet? Have you come up with titles or anything? Uh, not yet. No. Do you guys fight over this kind of thing? If you want to title oh, something? No. Or, do you get along pretty good oh, after back. this? How did you get together? How do you know each other? How did this happen? We met through our producer, John St. James. Oh, okay. um, we all basically auditioned and he put us together. Wonderful. We've been successful ever since. Yeah. Any, 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 what's been the biggest thrill of your entertainment point so far? Tokyo. 
<laughs> we I hear about Tokyo. What happened over there? We won an award at the new music, uh, the Tokyo Music Festival for Best New Dance Artist. Great, yeah. wonderful. All right. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, how long ago did you get the get the award? Was it during the past year or something? It was about or? two months ago. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was long. what's it like performing? Six months. Was it? Yeah. See, you're arguing already. <laughs> oh. Well. <laughs> what's the Tokyo audience like compared to American audiences? Um, they're real polite. So you don't really know if they like you or not right off the bat. <laughs> you know, but afterwards they come up and they, you know, they they're really warm. They're a lot friendlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. So they, it's kind of like applause with gloves on, or what? Would you say? Yeah. Give us some uh, Tokyo applause, yeah. folks. Some, something. Yes. Very nice. Yes. Oh. oh yeah. How'd you all get into the business? How'd you break in? How'd you start? Besides, before the producer ever put you together, what happened? I was working as a waitress and going to school part-time. I was a political science major at Cal State Fullerton. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I met our producer, John St. James, in the restaurant where I was working. I used to spill things on him. This poor man, every time he would come in, it would be like, boom. And um, he said, honey, you are just not cut out for this job. And he asked me if I could sing, and I lied, and I said yes. And I went down and auditioned. And, and here you are. Jazz, how about you? I was working in the re restaurant also, and um, at nights, and yeah. I was auditioning during the day as an actress and a model yeah. and a dancer. That was basically my background. I thought it would be great to get in the music business, but it was so hard, yeah. so I was auditioning for other parts during the day, and well, then I, I auditioned for John, and you put us and together. And there you are. I can't tell you how <laughs> proud I am to have you bite a couple cups for me and sign your name. We'll do it both. Just put your lip prints on there. Oh, yeah. oh, no. As the wafting perfume of Bardo still lingers in the studio, uh, their album Bold as Love. Thanks, girls, for performing for us. And thank you, our entire cast, for tonight. Uh, our guest, Keith Gordon, Bud Court. We had Joe Cabanera on, Susan Normandia from the L.A. Zoo, uh, Jackie Stallone. Huh? What did I say? Yeah, I, I, I've got to talk to John about this. John, uh, sorry, John Campanera, we love you. And also, our regulars, Carolyn Schlitt, Tony Forkus, Jackie Stallone was here, Bardo. Next week, Legal Reigns, Rick Dempsey, Carrie Mitchum, Larry Wilson, David Strassman. And remember, go see John Campanera somewhere. All right, good. That's it. We'll see you next